This is a production of Cornell University. All right, thank you for that introduction and for the invitation to come here. I've already enjoyed uh, meeting everyone so far. Um, so before I get started, I'll actually do my acknowledgments first, uh, mainly to point out, uh, so all of the Niscanthus work that I'm going to show, uh, Eric Sachs has been the, the PI leading this project, and it's been a huge uh, international uh, uh, effort. Um, so many, many collaborators around the world have helped us get this done. All right. So I'm going to spend the first half of the talk um, discussing uh, miscanthus and our, our breeding efforts and the genetic diversity of miscanthus. Um, and then I'm going to get into a couple bioinformatics topics, uh, both talking about polyrad for uh, genotype calling and talking about a new method that I'm working on for sorting out uh, paralogous loci um, in a, when you have an allopolyploid reference genome. So uh, miscanthus, if you're not familiar with it, is a, uh, it's a C4 grass that's a perennial and it's native to East Asia, so a very broad distribution in East Asia. This is a close relative of sugarcane, so uh, that puts it within the androphogonia with maize and sorghum as well. And so we're interested in it for bioenergy um, because uh, as a C4 grass, it does photosynthesis very efficiently, right? But it's much more temperate adapted than most C4 grasses. Um, so we can take advantage of that, um, you know, C4 photosynthesis, but have a longer growing season than, say, maize. Um, uh, we can create triploids that are sterile, and that helps mitigate uh, invasiveness concerns in the U.S. Um, and it also has some environmental benefits. Um, being a perennial, it's putting in a nice deep root system that helps prevent soil erosion and runoff from fertilizer, especially when this is interspersed in between our annual cropping systems. Um, so we have a couple different species shown here. So um, there's Miscanthus sacrofloris, uh, and uh, right under it, uh, Sacrofloris luterio riparius, which is a subspecies. Um, so that's, that's one of the parents of the, uh, the popular biomass clone, um, Giganteus, which is, oops, which is down here, um, as well as another species that's more clumping, which is uh, Sinensis and its close relative Florigilis. And Sinensis is also popular as an ornamental. So here's a tiny little ornamental variety that is pretty, but would be terrible for biomass. Um, all right, so I'm going to refer to this uh, uh, commercial biomass clone as 1993-1780. That's its number in the Kew Botanical Garden, so we've started calling it that. We had been calling it the Illinois clone, but it has nothing to do actually with Illinois, so that was a little bit um, too self-centered of us. So th th this is a, uh, one of these uh, sterile triploid hybrids. So it's a, a hybrid between a tetraploid sacrofloris and a diploid sinensis. Uh, and this wasn't something that was intentionally bred. It was collected in 1930 in the wild in Japan by a Danish botanist, uh, brought to Europe from there, and then eventually North America. Um, right, and so biomass uses of this include um, combustion in a biomass boiler. We're actually uh, heating one of our greenhouses this way right now. Um, there's some research into converting it into liquid fuels. Um, and then it has other um, more generic biomass uses like paper making or construction or animal bedding. Um, now, one big problem is this is, right, this is one vegetatively propagated clone. Um, so uh, that makes it very susceptible to if, if a new disease comes along, it could wipe out the entire system for that. Um, and we're also uh, wanting to create some new biomass clones uh, for better environmental adaptation. Uh, so this is, these, these three maps, um, what I'm showing here, they're all hardiness zone maps um, of Japan and Europe and, and the U.S. Uh, and so, uh, you know, this is showing the, the minimum uh, winter temperature that we typically see. Um, and these are lined up by latitude as well. So right over here, we, we've got, uh, you know, the approximate collection location of this clone. And you can see that it's in like hardiness zone eight or nine. So that's about the, the type of winter that it can survive. Um, and then if you look up in Europe, um, it's about the same hardiness zone. So it's able to deal with the winters there as well. Uh, but because it's a more northern latitude, it's going to flower later because the, uh, 
because the summer days are uh, longer, right? And uh, that's good for, for pure biomass yield because as soon as this plant flowers, it's basically stopped its vegetative growth for the season. So that uh, enables it to continue growing for longer up there. As in some areas, it doesn't flower at all. Versus in the US, if you look at the same latitudes, we have much harsher winters, right? So if we try growing it where we are in Illinois, um, if we have a particularly uh, bad winter, especially with first year plantings, we get a lot of freeze damage, right? Or you could bring it further south where the winters are more mild, but then the summer days are too short and it flowers too early to yield well. Um, and because this is the only clone, we are getting into this danger zone where like, a farmer says, oh, I tried out miscanthus, it didn't really work out for me, I guess I won't do that anymore. Um, but miscanthus itself as a genus is native to a huge range of environments uh, in East Asia. We have miscanthus sacrofloris in hardiness zone three, so very cold regions in Russia. And then um, we can also go even a lot further south than where this clone originated to get germplasm that will flower later. Um, so we really have the ability to select uh, genotypes that will be much better for specific environments in North America. Right. And this is just an example. So um, in, at the beginning of 2014, we had an extremely cold day where it got down to negative 25 Celsius. So this is the following spring. And here in the lower right, uh, this is that, that commercial clone having taken a lot of damage. And these are just some other clones that we had that various people had made. Um, so just, just from a few different crosses, we have some that are better at dealing with the winter. All right, so now I'll talk a bit about Miscanthus sinensis. So this is one of the parents of that, of that clone. Um, this one is a, a exclusively diploid, very you know, rarely we'll find triploids in, in the wild, but mostly diploid. So this is a, a clumping grass, so it will stay kind of together in one clump and it doesn't really spread unless you deliberately divide it. Um, native, and its native range, it grows on hillsides and in grasslands. Um, and this is, this is the one that you'll popular, uh, commonly see as an ornamental plant um, around the US and in Europe as well. Um, so we uh, had a, a huge collection of miscanthus from our, our various collaborators and we ran a rad or genotyping by sequencing um, on these to understand the population structure. So each of these uh, different colors represents an ancestral population that we determined with the structure software. And each pie chart is one individual shown where it was collected. Um, so the takeaway from this is we have these seven populations and we can see how we're rela they're related to each other. Um, so we were able to see that Southeast China was sort of the, the center of diversity and the center of radiation for this species. And it actually went directly from uh, there to Japan uh, rather than, than going through uh, mainland Asia first, which is consistent with what we know about um, uh, warming after the last ice age. Right, and so we also have these planted in some field trials. Actually, these, are, these have been wrapped up. Um, these were planted in 2012. And so what was also so great about having these international collaborations is we um, had a wide variety of field sites. So three in North America and three in Asia. Um, now there are some import restrictions into the US. So the two sites, um, Colorado State and the University of Illinois, um, we had a, a much smaller set of germplasm. But um, this NEF new, is uh, New Energy Farms in Ontario. So they were able to plant the whole set as well as uh, Hokkaido University, Kangwon National University. And at Zhejiang University, this is a subtropical site where the others were temperate. So we got some, uh, to see some interesting G by E effects there. All right. Um, so one thing, this, this was part of uh, Hong Xu Dong's PhD thesis, was looking at overwintering ability in these populations. And he could definitely see there was this very clear relationship with the latitude of origin and how well they overwintered at the northern sites. Um, but there, there are a few genotypes that were from more southern latitudes that still overwintered decently well. So these are good targets um, for breeding if we want something that's high yielding from being southern adapted but can still survive our winters. Right. Uh, we also looked, of course, at biomass yield of these. So each 
each of these box plots, they're ordered by the latitude of the, the field trial. Each one represents a field trial, and then each box is a different population. Um, and uh, just due to misidentification during collection, we had some uh, diploid first generation hybrids between um, Sinensis and Sacrofloris. And those actually performed fantastically well um, in our temperate sites. So there's some sort of hybrid vigor between Sinensis and Sacrofloris, and it's not Floydy specific. So um, right, the dotted line is the uh, triploid commercial clone, and some of the diploids exceeded that. Okay. And at Zhejiang University, our southern site, we saw that when we looked at the southern uh, adapted germplasm, it really did amazingly well. So like right here, this is a tick mark indicating 80 tons per hectare. Now this is ex uh, extrapolated up from single plant plots. So the, realistically, it's probably something smaller than that. But even if we're estimating it conservatively, this could compete with sugarcane, um, which would really be a game changer because um, even though you might be able to grow sugarcane in this region, um, uh, you don't have to replant miscanthus as often. Um, so this could actually be, be a better biomass crop than sugarcane, um, even where sugarcane is popular. Of course, we need to do more studies to actually show that, but this is a you know, very promising initial result. All right. Because we had the collection locations of everything and we had uh, different field trial locations, we were also able to build a climate model uh, showing uh, roughly what would be the best place to go collect for, for better germplasm for these sites. So what went into this model was the yield of each genotype at each site, as well as the um, bioclimatic variables like you know, mean annual temperature, temperature of the coldest month, precipitation, um, for each field trial location and each collection location. Um, so southern Japan is sort of, it's like, um, I don't want to say common knowledge, but I guess in the Miscanthus community, common, common knowledge that, oh, southern Japan is where you go for the best Miscanthus. So that did come up in our model for temperate sites, but we also found that um, high elevation regions in China, especially at lower latitudes, uh, could also be very high yielding. And we have um, this one particular genotype that sort of exemplified that. This one has done really well in the field. It's been a good parent for breeding. Um, and that's because it has the, you know, the cold temperature from the high elevation, but its flowering time is adapted to that um, lower latitude, so it flowers later. Versus if we looked at our subtropical location, in some ways it was the opposite in terms of what did better. Um, so, you know, we had our very high yielding types that were from uh, southeast China, but the model predicts that if we go collect the Ryukyu, Ryukyu Islands and Taiwan and the Philippines will probably get some even better miscanthus. And I'm sure miscanthus exists there, we just haven't collected it. All right, um, so we've done some uh, genomite association and genomic selection. Um, nothing too earth shattering here. We had, we had a lot of different traits that aren't all shown here. So we did identify a pretty large number of SNPs just across all of those traits. Um, and we have a couple that's probably showing up really tiny, but one for yield and one for compressed circumference that were actually right next to QTL peaks that had been found in the mapping population. Uh, so that's somewhat promising. Um, and after controlling for population structure, we have uh, moderate genomic prediction accuracies in this population. And if we combined uh, all of our traits together to make a yield index, that improved our prediction accuracy a bit. So Miscanthus sacrifloris is the other uh, species that we're interested in. So this is the tetraploid parent of Giganteus, and it exists in both diploid and tetraploid forms. Um, so this is much more of a spreading species. Um, you'll find it growing along riverbanks in Asia. Um, and there are a couple ornamental varieties that you can purchase in the US, but they're less popular because it, this will spread and take over your garden. All right, uh, so here's Eric uh, back in 2012 in a collection expedition to uh, Russia. So I mentioned that some of these are, are winter hardy up to zone three in, in Russia. So here's a big field of Miscanthus sacrifloris up there. 
Right, and we also, uh, we have field trials going. Uh, those are, are wrapping up, so I don't really have results to, to present yet, but um, here's our, our subtropical location, and you can also see there's some, some very tall uh, sacrophores in the background there. Right, so we also, uh, you know, ran RADSEQ on this and did population structure to, to understand the origins of these populations and what they were. Right, and so we have uh, three diploid populations, this northeastern one that's very widespread, sort of a North China diploid population, and then this Yangtze population, which is the subspecies Luterio riparius. So sometimes that's considered its own species, but we found that it seems to be this sort of bottleneck offshoot from the North China population. Um, but this is an extremely high yielding uh, subpopulation of Miscanthus. And we also had uh, three tetraploid populations. Um, so one that was mainland Asia and then two in Japan. Interestingly, we found a couple of tetraploids up in Russia, but the, there's, you know, there's this whole region in between where we didn't have any. Um, so those might be some sort of relic or perhaps the result of an anthropogenic introduction, although they do have some genetic similarity to the diploids nearby. I, uh, one exciting thing we learned is that um, the Japanese and mainland Asia tetraploids have uh, different origins. So the, the first split of these populations from each other, this is based on the nuclear markers, is Japan versus mainland, which means that the Japan polyploidization has to be a different, um, different event from the um, mainland polyploidization event. Um, and we also found that when we look at, looked at plastid markers, uh, we see the same thing where the, the Asian uh, tetraploids group in with the Asian diploids. Right. Another um, really exciting and kind of perplexing thing we found is that somehow the tetraploid is facilitating introgression um, from the other species even though they are different floidy levels. Um, so we did find uh, diploid first generation hybrids, as I mentioned, some of those are, you know, fantastically high yielding. We have them, you know, that we found both in Korea and China, um, but we don't see them back crossing the either species. And we know that they're fertile from our own experiments. We've been able to make F2 populations and these sorts of things. Um, but in, in the wild, we just don't find those introgressions. Um, but uh, in the tetraploids, we do find tetraploid first generation hybrids. Um, and we see these a lot when we make crosses too between diploid sentences and tetraploid sacrophores. So something is sort of selecting for non-reduced gametes in, in sinensis or something like that. Um, but interestingly, in the tetraploids, we get all of this back crossing that happens in nature. Um, so maybe this has something to do with uh, dominance and epistasis and allele dosage. Um, I think this would be, you know, a very exciting project to pursue in the future, but we, right now we don't have an answer for why this is happening. All right. We've also been able to compare the genetic diversity of these and based on their population structure, estimate where they were during the last glacial maximum. So we think that Saccharophorus, um, based on its center of diversity, was spread over a much wider area. So all of this, you know, at this point, this was a land mass, right? Um, so Sacrophorus seems centered around here. Sinensis was confined to this little strip, also based on what we know about the vegetation history there. And we see that in the markers, where we're using the same marker system. Uh, we got many more markers with Sacrophorus. Uh, we got more plastitaplotypes with Sacrophorus. Um, and the Sinensis uh, populations are more diverged from each other, suggesting a no smaller effective population size. Um, you know, and, and bigger bottleneck events as it spread out through Asia. All right, so I mentioned that we have tetraploid sacrophorus, and we're getting going with the doing genome-wide association for that, um, but we need a way to estimate allele dosage from the genotyping by sequencing data um, in those tetraploids, right? And that is something that you would expect to you know, improve the GWAS over just calling it as a, sorry, as a uh, 
naive diploid model, right? Because this is, is a linear regression, and if you're looking for additive effects, you want to um, <coughs> estimate that allele dosage accurately. Um, right, so having it categorized as diploids versus tetraploids. In this case, um, this tetraploid one did worse because, you know, with the tetraploids, we, if we're trying to really categorize it as one genotype or the other, we can do so with less confidence, so more of them ended up being imputed. But here are a couple methods that I'm going to get into where we can actually treat the genotype as a continuous variable, and that um, estimates allele dosage and incorporates our uncertainty, um, and we can still do linear regression with that for GWAS. All right. So, um, you know, allele dosage is a, is a big issue in general with, with polyploid genotyping, um, uh, as well as allelic dropout. Um, and if you want to, um, you know, be certain that's not going to happen and that you have various high certainty in your genotyping, um, you're going to have to spend quite a lot of money sequencing at very high depth, which you might not want to do. Um, and so even when you think, okay, it should follow these nice ratios, um, there are technical issues that might bias it towards one allele or the other. So this data can be pretty messy. So with you know, the data that we can afford, um, what's the best genotype estimates we can do? So Bayesian genotype calling is a way to deal with this. Um, so with, as with you know, Bayesian probability in general, you have a likelihood. So the likelihood of the data given the hypothesis. So in this case, the hypothesis is this genotype is AAAB. My data is I have seven reads of A and four reads of B, so what's the probability that this genotype would produce that read distribution? You have a prior, which is how often am I generally expecting to find AAAB in the population? And so you can do that using allele frequencies and some other um, population parameters. All right, I think I will sit down at this point. <laughs> um, all right. And so uh, you can put those together to, to get a posterior probability saying, uh, okay, if I, if I know that this is my read depth, what's the probability that that's the true genotype? Right. Um, so in practicality, and you know, in, in what, what this actually amounts to is that when you have very high depth, the, the posterior probabilities are driven by the likelihoods. So this is just a, a diploid example for the sake of space, but Right, if I had, you know, 100 reads and they were all from one allele, I'm going to say, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a, hom a homozygote. And so there's going to be a very low likelihood on the other two uh, genotypes. And so then it doesn't matter what the, what the priors were so much. So the likelihood is, is here on the, the height of these rectangles. The priors is the width, and then the posterior probability is the area. And as read depth gets lower, we become less and less certain about uh, the genotypes based on read depth alone. And so then they're driven more by the prior probabilities in terms of, of what that um, genotype estimate is. And one way this plays out is that, um, say you have a, a rare allele in your population and you have an individual that say has like three reads and they're of that allele and no reads of the common allele. So if you went on likelihoods alone, it would look like a homozygote because that's the most likely genotype. Um, but if you have your priors, you say, well, I'm not expecting very many homozygotes of that genotype. So actually the most probable genotype is the heterozygote. And the nice thing about this, too, is that if you have informative priors, this is basically you're doing your genotyping and your imputation at the same time. Because if read depth is zero, all of the likelihoods are one, and then the posterior probability equals the prior. So we also get continuous genotypes out of this, um, which are, uh, you know, the, 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 so these are posterior mean genotypes. Basically, um, you multiply the allele copy number, uh, each possible allele copy number, by the probability of that allele copy number, and then sum them together. And so this is a case where we're not really sure if we have one or two copies, and there's even some probability of having three copies. So we have this sort of average copy number across those. 
And so that gives you a continuous genotype that you can still use for um, regression against your phenotype. All right, so there are a few pieces of software that have all come out in the past couple of years that will do this. Um, EBG is, is the first one, and that's based on Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium with some options for inbreeding or allopolyploids. Um, there's an R package called Updog, which is um, a little better at modeling technical issues that come up with library preparation, um, but it, it takes a while to process. Uh, and Polyrad is mine, um, and being the, more of a biologist, whereas Updog was made more by a statistician, I'm thinking about population structure and linkage disequilibrium and how those influence the priors. Um, and that means that we're also not treating each marker in isolation, but the priors for one marker are influenced by the genotypes at other markers. So that means that your high depth markers are going to sort of help pull up your low depth markers in quality. Right. And this is a case, um, I might sort of gloss through this because I know I'm more limited for time than I thought I would be, of um, uh, population structure uh, influencing the priors. So this is a PCA of population structure, and you can see how the prior probabilities are varying uh, for, for this one particular marker are varying across the population structure. Um, so that means that, that we're not using the same priors over here that we are over here. And so each, each individual has its own prior for that genotype um, based on uh, who it's related to, you know, what population it came from. Right? Um, and this, uh, this is also a demonstration that Polyrad uh, can improve genotyping accuracy with respect to some other methods. Um, like GATK does it very naively, which has an even prior for everything, and it doesn't really model allopolyploidy, so this is a simulated allopolyploid. Um, so Polyrad does much better than GATK. Be, be, uh, to, to make a long story short, being above the, the solid line here means that Polyrad performed better than this method. Um, all right, and Updog and EBG are a bit better, but in this case, um, Polyrad still outperformed them. And then this is showing that basically you can use polyrad for imputation at the same time, and that having population structure and linkage to equilibrium um, are useful for that imputation. All right, um, so this is uh, an R package available on CRAN and GitHub. Uh, it can import in a variety of formats. Um, it can work on both natural populations and mapping populations, auto and allopolyploids. Um, and I have a PhD student who is right now working on a study to, to demonstrate that uh, with Bayesian genotype calling, you're increasing your power for GWAS. Um, hopefully, it'll also show that polyrad is the best, but I'm okay if it shows that, as long as it shows that Bayesian methods are better than naive methods. All right. Um, so, yeah, over the last uh, few minutes of my talk, I'm going to talk 10 minutes. Okay. I'm going to talk about a new method that I'm working on for um, basically correcting genome alignment. So um, I've been re referring to miscanthus as diploid and tetraploid, but even the diploids are actually an ancient allotetraploid. So for each ancestral uh, grass chromosome, there are two chromosomes in miscanthus. Um, so that not only meant that it took us a very long time to get a reference genome, but it means that we have um, a lot of uncertainty in our alignments to that reference genome. And we can see some evidence when we look at our sequence read depths that these aren't really Mendelian loci, and so we probably have some um, misaligned sequence tags. All right, and so in part that's because if you have an aligner like Bowtie or BWA that was originally designed with the human genome in mind, um, and if you're having it uh, return just the best alignment, um, you know, the best alignment, A, might not be the correct alignment, um, and B, if it has two equally good alignments, it's picking what, one at random. And if I know I have, you know, two paralogs, I, I really don't want to just pick one at random. Um, right, and so for pipelines for variant calling like GATK and Stacks, they're aligning every read. So um, a set of reads that all belong to the same tag might be aligned to a mix of different locations. Um, or we've used tassel GBS a lot, which aligns each tag once, and then if that's wrong, then the whole data set is wrong. 
All right. So observed heterozygosity is a really good way to identify these collapsed paralogs. Um, but there are some issues, especially because um, there's a lot of missing data um, and undersampling and genotyping by sequencing. So we might not even sample both paralogs to see for sure that that um, is looking heterozygous when it shouldn't. Um, right, and there are other technical issues like messiness that can make a, a homozygote look heterozygous. Um, and of course, I'm working with an outcrossing species, so it's not as easy a case with an inbred species where it's like, oh, well, nothing should be heterozygous. So if this is heterozygous, I'm automatically going to be suspicious of it. Um, right, so those are some limitations to using heterozygosity to identify these, um, you know, paralogous loci that were combined into one. Um, and also, because the Bayesian genotype calling can be kind of computationally intensive, it would be nice if we could filter before doing that rather than after. All right. Um, so instead of using observed heterozygosity, I've come up with this uh, statistic um, that right now I'm calling it HN. So this is um, sort of uh, related to observed and uh, expected heterozygosity, but it's something that you measure. Um, in one individual by one locus at a time. Um, and you look at, um, for that locus across all of the tags um, and all of the read depth you're getting in those tags, what would be the probability that if you sampled two tags, they would be different from each other, right? So that doesn't require you to call the genotype first. Um, it allows for multiple alleles rather than being forced to use like a biallelic SNP. Um, so it's using that that information like for the whole uh, GBS tag. Um, and this will work for, for any ploidy. Right. And so if I take that H in and divide it by the expected heterozygosity, um, there is an expected value, and I'll talk a little bit about where this comes from, um, where it should be the ploidy minus one divided by the ploidy divided by or multiplied by one minus the inbreeding coefficient. So what I did here was I took a bunch of sequencing data from Miscanthus, and I aligned it both to Misc the, the Miscanthus reference, which has both copies, and to sorghum, where by aligning it to sorghum, I'm deliberately merging two pyrologous loci into one loci. So I'm deliberately making loci that are not going to behave in a Mendelian way. And so um, if I take H end and H E, H end over H E for each locus, and look at the distribution of that with those two alignments. In sorghum, most of them are much, have a much higher value than what I'm expecting to get. Whereas miscanthus, they're right about where I expect. They're probably, you know, the peak is just a little bit below, probably due to population structure. Um, but I can see even when, with miscanthus, I have some of these that are higher than expected, which is probably, th those are the ones that align to the wrong homeolog in miscanthus. All right, and so the reason why this works out, so um, HE is the probability that in the whole population, if you sampled two different alleles, they're going, or, you know, two alleles, they're going to be different from each other. Um, this ploidy minus one over the ploidy is that if within one individual, if you sampled two chromosomes with replacement, um, that's the probability that there'll be different chromosomes. So that's like one half in a diploid, it's three quarters in a tetraploid. 1 minus f is the uh, probability that uh, um, a pair of alleles in an individual will not be identical by descent. So when these all are multiplied together, then you're getting the probability that if you sample two sequencing reads from that individual, that those different alleles are going to be, you know, those two alleles are going to be different from each other by state. Um, and what I haven't add, oop, added in is that these are, um, we do scale it a little bit by read depth um, uh, to correct for just the sample size of how many reads you have in that, that individual. All right, so you do need a large um, population in order to do this. So this isn't going to save an RNA-seq experiment or something like that, but it's good for, for variant calling in big populations. Um, it is only good up to a certain read depth. Like I found if, if my median read depth is five or lower, there's not really much point to doing this statistic. Um, but the, the higher the read depth, the less variance you're going to get in the estimate, um, right? And you might also need to know, or you do need to know ploidy and inbreeding 
Um, but you can take a good guess at those just looking at the initial distribution of that if you had to. Um, and I'm still thinking about how to do it for mapping populations. I'm sure it, it shouldn't be that too complicated. I just need to think on the math for that. All right, um, so this uh, uh, is useful not only for filtering, you can say, okay, the value is too high, I'm throwing out that locus, um, but we could use this statistic for actually correcting alignments. Um, so we, if, allow, if we allow for multiple alignments, um, and we see, okay, there are multiple places this tag could go, then we can kind of rearrange the sequence tags across alignment locations to try to optimize this statistic. Um, so both of these, uh, I'm, I have implementation that's mostly done that will be released with Polyrad. All right. Okay, I'm actually, wow, well, I'm on time. <laughs> it was 50 minutes last night. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I, yeah, may, and this is a, kind of a complicated flow chart, but this is my algorithm for rearranging uh, those tags uh, to, to try to optimize um, alignment. So I actually start with the first couple steps of Tassel GBS because it's very efficient for finding all of the unique sequence tags in the GBS data set and then tallying up um, the read depth of each of those tags in every individual. And like Tassel, I'm doing, then doing an alignment, but I'm allowing uh, multiple alignments to be reported. If I have more alignments than the number of subgenomes that I'm expecting, I throw the marker out. But if, you know, if I have an owl tetraploid and I have two alignments, um, then I'm going to keep that and say, okay, probably this, this belongs to one of those two. And then I group up the tags based on the unordered set of alignments. So it doesn't matter which alignment was better, just that the set of tags all align to the same two places. Um, and so initially I assign, um, and I'm using the term isolocus here to be basically mean one paralogous locus or the other. Um, you know, so based on you know, where did it align best, that's the initial um, assignment. And then I check, okay, does this um, exceed my expectation for my H end over HE statistic? Um, if it doesn't, then that's good. I'm gonna keep that set of alignments. Um, if it does, then I'm gonna try swapping some of the tags around. So first I use um, negative read depth correlations, uh, which I don't have time to explain why that works, but I, a few years ago I published something in microsatellites on, on how you can um, see if two alleles belong to the same locus or not based on these correlations. Um, and so if, if two alleles are negatively correlated, I make sure that they both go to the same alignment location. And then again, I check, okay, did that fix my problem? And if it doesn't, then I perform um, a type of search algorithm called a taboo search where I look, okay, for this you know, solution of, of groups of tags, what are all of the neighboring um, solutions and are any of them better, right? And eventually if I, if I just can't uh, you know, get that uh, value below an acceptable cutoff, then I'm going to throw away the marker. Um, but in most cases, um, this algorithm has worked for, for fixing that value. So, here I have like the starting H end over HE on the X axis and the final H end HE on the Y axis um, after running this algorithm. Um, so a lot of them started quite a bit above um, the expectation, but if I just swapped one or two tags, I was able to get it um, to add or below the expected, val expected value. And that worked out both in, um, diploids and tetraploid. So something that was tetraploid on top of being allotetraploid. All right. And so of course, in this, this is all empirical data. So I don't know if I got it right. I just know the statistic looks better. Um, so my master's student, Whitney Mays, is uh, working on um, simulating some sequence tags from an allopolyploid genome and simulating the read depth and then seeing if this um, algorithm is, is finding the right answers or not. All right, so thank you very much for the invitation and I'll, I'll take any questions. Uh-huh. So, so Lindsay, first of all, great talk. On the, first on the biological side, I was kind of wondering, you're getting these massive yields out of some of these uh, hybrids. What's the harvest index like? I mean, what, 
Are they making seed? I mean, I, I guess I don't have a good feel for this campus. Does it ever make a lot of seed? Or are we just substituting seed for biomass? Or how does that work out? Um, so, I mean, this campus, oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Um, so uh, Ed is asking about the harvest index um, for Miscanthus and if the um, if the hybrids produce a lot of seed or not. Um, so Miscanthus in general, it's, it produces lots of very tiny seeds. Um, I don't know if we've looked at seed production for the hybrids. I mean, we're talking about you know yield for for dry biomass overall. Um, I mean, they've been. They tend to be fertile enough that you know we get enough seed that we can make you know make an F two from them. Um, I, I think they're. Well, actually, I don't know if they have reduced fertility, but I know in some cases we we have observed that the um, self incompatibility starts to break down a little bit. Any other questions? Uh, oh. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, so uh the star is asking about um you know, why why would Bayesian um genotype calling be better in a polyploid than um than normal uh you know traditional genotype calling. I mean I think that it it can be better in a polyploid or a diploid, but the I mean the the real place where it's better is where you just have too few reads to have high confidence in the genotype based on read depth alone. And so that's where having a, a, a prior probability from the population is going to improve the accuracy a lot. Um, and because, especially, you know, in, in diploids, it's not, especially in an inbred diploid, but even in an in a, in a outcrossing diploid, it's not too hard to get enough depth that you can be fairly sure about the genotypes. But that, that um, the depth needed for high confidence goes up very, very fast as you increase the ploidy. Um, to the point where it's it's just not worth the money to get enough sequencing depth to be sure about the genotype. So then then having having something that's going to kind of coax the calls in the right direction, I think, is then helpful. Yeah. So when you did your sampling of uh, Sacrophorus mm -hmm. and you identified pointies, was that identified by pro cytometry or how did you do it? Use the, the data to actually identify pointies by pointies. Yeah, so the, the question was, how did we identify the, the ploides in the Sacrophorus collection? We did do um, flow cytometry on uh, pretty much everything. You know, I think there was a, a small minority of genotypes where we didn't have material for flow cytometry, especially where we, we didn't have any one location where everything was alive. Um, so that was a limitation. But because we had flow cytometry on almost everything, we were able to classify the rest based on their apparent heterozygosity and based on which genetic group they were in. Um diploids versus what? Oh yeah, yeah, repeat the question. Yeah. So without flow cytometry, could we have done this? Um, so if I plotted like a overall missing data rate versus overall heterozygosity, the um, it was it was pretty easy to tell the diploids apart versus the triploids and tetraploids. But distinguishing the triploids and tetraploids from each other was uh, I don't think we would have been able to confidently do that, um, especially because there was so much hybridization that was a little bit of a confounding factor too, because that's going to give it, you a bump to your apparent heterozygosity. Uh, <laughs> oh, or was there, was there anyone else? Okay. So, uh, so on the HN index, I thought that was uh, really nice, but you got to focus mostly on tags. So, if you thought about doing a shotgun sequence, I think I, I, mean, I can see the data structure you could create to do the tabu or tabu search once you had that. So, have you been working down the shotgun sequence? 
Uh, so the, the question is, would the, have I been working with the agent on um, shotgun sequencing data instead of um, GBS data? Well, I haven't, I haven't pri primarily because I don't have any shotgun sequencing like data sets from our lab to, to work with. Um, right, and then, then you kind of have to, I guess, decide, you know, are, are you going to like find a certain haplotype level at which you're working with the data? Or are you going to try to work with it as biallelic SNP markers? Um, so I, yeah, I haven't gotten into that, but that, that is certainly be an interesting application. You might have to repeat it again. Okay. I'm not sure whether they can hear me from here. So, will the H and HE statistic work for auto polyploids? All right. The question is will H and over HE work for auto polyploids? Um, I mean, so, so part with the, I mean, the goal that I was showing was determining which subgenome it, it, it goes to. And in an auto polyploid, you, you only have, you know, one, one genome. But, it might still be useful for estimating the ploidy, right? Because the expectation is that if you divide it by it, expected heterozygosity, um, it's going to be, you know, one half for a diploid or three quarters for a tetraploid and so on. So it might be useful for distinguishing ploidies in a case where you've got sequencing data, but you're not able to do flow cytometry. Other questions? Mm -hmm. How would it complicate the uh, uh, ploidy analysis if you have gene duplications on top of the uh, duplication of the whole chromosome? Yes, I think that, um, yeah, so the question, question is, um, if you have gene, gene duplications on top of the allopolyploidy duplication, is that going to, to complicate this method? And um, Yes, especially if you're saying, okay, I'm just trying to sort it into two loci, and the reality is that there are four or six, um, then, right, you're not going to be getting the, the right answer, and then your H end over HE estimates are probably still going to be too high when they're done. Um, so, uh, I mean, right, as I've written the pipeline right now, that would probably just get thrown out, but you could hypothetically say, okay, well, I'm going to open it up to looking for um, you know, more and more loci, it's just how, how accurately is, is it going to be able to do that is the question, I think. One more question. No? Okay, I want to thank Thanks. you very much. Very <laughs> this has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.